Well, hello everybody, Pastor Joel here with you one more time for the past days with Pastor Joel. So, a couple preliminary things uh, before we get to today's content. Um, first of all, we have subscriber 125. Uh, several videos ago, we, we had 121 subscribers at the time, and I was saying when we got to 125, that person could let me know that they were subscriber 125, and they could tell me what video they wanted me to produce. So I know who you are, you know who you are. I've not seen a comment about which video you would like me to produce. I may have missed it, but I tried to go back through. And so if you would do me the kindness, and you know who you are, um, either, either leave a comment, you know, on my YouTube page, um, get, catch me on Facebook or something, and uh, let me know if, if you have a certain video you would like me to do, and I will try to do that. Also, just wanted to clarify something. Um, in my last video, um, I talked about sometimes some, some predators acting like junior high, where if I like that person, I can't listen to that person, or I can't live, and just just realize, you know, um, you know, you get to talking sometimes, and, and uh, you know, maybe I could have said it a little, little bit differently, but I was not taking shots at any at any person in particular. Um, I was very involved in Facebook groups for a while, like on different eschatological end time type of Facebook groups, um, because it was super helpful for me to just, that's when I was trying to learn things, sort of the beginning of my process, and um, I needed to be very careful who I was telling in my church community at that time, um, because I just wanted to make sure, okay, am I, am I getting this right? And I wanted to learn and spend some serious time studying it, before I was comfortable talking about it a little bit more um, in my you know closer sphere of, of uh, friends and influences and things at the time. And so in those groups, there, there were some wonderful things, but that's where I saw just some of that infighting and there, there and I'm, we're gonna get into the content in just a minute, but this is important. There, there are some issues where even predators can be so harsh with each other and even sometimes outrightly accuse each other of being heretics. And I just think, boy, if anybody should be you know, pause a little bit and be careful before they condemn people and call them heretics. Shouldn't it be those of us who have been condemned and called heretics by others? That's kind of all I was saying. And here are, the, here are those areas that I've seen. Um, spiritual gifts. Are any of them present for today? How are they present? And I think in that particular conversation, it's often like two ships passing in the wind. They're not paying attention to what each other is saying. Um, so that would be one. Um, talked about another one where there, in the last video where there are some preterists that believe the Old Covenant ended at the cross. But the big, big biggie is what's often referred to as the individual body view, sometimes individual body at death view, versus the corporate body at death view. And again, as I've studied both these views, and, and I have and I will continue to, I think a lot of times they're, they're, not, they're not listening to each other. Um, and, and it causes a lot of unnecessary confusion. Um, and so those are the areas where I've just seen people be very, very unkind to each other, sometimes vicious. And that's what I was speaking out um, against because we always need to remember, you know, at the end of the day, uh, whatever our particular eschatological or theological position is, uh, we also need to pay attention to the Bible in terms of how we treat one another when we're discussing and debating those views. And if we're going to get to a point where we're going to you know, sort of publicly out people and condemn them, we, we, we better be really, really careful uh, about doing that. And that and that's all I was saying in that. But uh, neither here nor there, I thought about, you know, should I redo that? But I, I don't edit these videos. I'm doing them in my truck. They're low budget. And then we're moving on, you know, to the next thing. And so I just wanted to mention that. And, and now we are at Israel, um, a little more specifically, um, as we're doing the series of videos called Why We Believe What We Believe, um, meaning, why did we have? Why did so many of us have this, this particular view of the end times and eschatology? And I've traced out some of the reasons for that. We've looked so far at a little bit of the history of dispensationalism with John Nelson Darby in particular, and 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 some of the things that sort of came from his teachings. We've looked at the um, the, the secret rapture coming. We've looked at that. We've looked a little bit at the millennium. We've talked about this this distinction between Israel and the church, and we're going to get just a, a bit more specifically into the nation of Israel in this fourth video. I would recommend you go back and, and look at the previous three for some context. So a huge part of the dispensational framework has to do with the role Israel plays in the last days, okay? I uh, didn't say anything shocking there. Um, so let me comment again briefly as to how Israel gained such prominence in this system, especially in light of the verses I shared regarding God's one people. That was back to Ephesians 
2, where Paul's saying that, that God has obliterated the wall of distinction between Jews and Gentiles and created what, what he referred to as the one new humanity of God. Now for some, potentially even some of those of you watching, but more likely some of your family members, friends, etc., to deny that the nation of Israel has main character status in the end times, meaning as they would see it, the end times now or the end times coming, to deny that Israel has main character status is borderline blasphemy. In other words, to say that the Israel of today has nothing to do with biblical Israel, the Israel of today is not the same as Old Covenant Israel, to say that is borderline blasphemous, if not get rid of the borderline and just saying blasphemous. And again, I've experienced a lot of heat, a lot of name calling just for that. Many see Israel's role to be greater than that of the church. Again, that's why the church is raptured, according to this view. One of the reasons so, so Yahweh can get back to working with his chosen people, the apple of his eye, the nation of Israel, meaning modern Israel. Many still view national Israel as God's chosen people. Some dispensationalists go so far as to believe that the Jews can be saved in the Great Tribulation and in the Millennial Kingdom by adhering to the Mosaic Law. Mosaic law. Now, John Hagee even today, says that it's basically a waste of time to evangelize to the Jews because they don't need it. Think of that. This creates a means of salvation that is different from those who claim salvation is by faith alone through Christ alone. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 would be a specific place to look for that. This is rather troubling to say the least. Have you read Galatians 1, 7 lately? What well, Galatians 1 7 says, and by the way, this is used oftentimes in a way that it's, it's a fair way to apply it to speak against cults today. But when Paul wrote it, he's not talking about Jehovah's Witnesses, he's not talking about the Latter day Saints, he's not talking about, you know, creation science or what have you. None of that's there. None of that was in existence. He's talking about the different gospel. Is the, is the gospel basically of the, of the Pharisees or, or the religious leaders, where they might even include Christ in some way, but it's still adhering to the Old Covenant law. That's what Paul is saying, anathema. And he says it again, if anyone comes to you and preaches a gospel, even an angel other than this one, let them be anathema. Very, very strong language. And yet, without probably knowing it, in many cases, just out of ignorance, that's the kind of gospel at least in some way, shape, or form, that may be present in the Millennial Kingdom. Let that sink in. Now, I do not deny the importance of Israel at all. Almost the entire Old Testament portrays Israel as being the main character other than Yahweh himself. Much of the New Testament is also focused on Israel. It's the same people, right? A huge mistake I made, a huge mistake so many of us made. Um, I think this will be left to right for you as you're watching. But let's say, you know, Genesis here, let's say Malachi here, New Testament starts about, about here. We make this false line of demarcation. Now we're starting something brand new. No, this is the same people. This is Old Covenant Israel that Jesus is speaking to and, and many of whom the apostles are talking to. It's the same people. So even the New Testament is, is so largely about the nation of Israel. So I do not deny that. In fact, the, the first church that I pastored, one of my interview questions was, do you love Israel? Now at that time, I was fairly reformed. My views of scripture, um, eschatologically, was probably an ah mill something or other. Um, but that church was, was very dispensational. And so when they asked me that question, and it was either the first question when I got it, one of them, do you love Israel? You know, I'm kind of thinking, <clears throat> because I, I do love Israel, what I love today is the, is the Israel of God, who are all true believers. Right, that's just what Paul called it, the Israel of God. But I knew what they meant by that question was different than what I meant in my answer. And I was kind of glad they didn't ask many follow-up questions, um, because that, that ended up, I think, being a good, a good, a good situation. Uh, there being a pastor, and I think the people were, were fine, uh, for the most part, with what, with what I taught and so on. But, uh, so I don't deny the importance of Israel. But again, we need to understand who Israel truly is. And I'm going to use this scripture one more time. I've used it in both of the last two videos, but I think it's so important. So Peter applies language that had been used specifically to ethnic Israel in the book of Exodus, and he applies it to the church. 
1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Now amazingly, take a drink of my coffee here, that's not so amazing. But amazingly, I, I mean, I've had conversations with people, they'll, they'll see that specific scripture. But in order for it to fit in their dispensational paradigm, they have to deny what Peter is saying. Their arguments with Peter, again, I've mentioned this in other videos, if you can, always get people to argue. If they're wanting to argue with you, get them to argue with Peter, get them to argue with Jesus, get them to argue with John, get them to argue with Matthew, with, with Paul, etc. Because no Christian that's sincere really wants to be arguing with the scriptures. But there's this term, replacement theology. Now, I don't hold to replacement theology. I, I prefer to call it fulfilled theology or fulfillment theology. But clearly, all through the Old Testament, one of the mega themes there is that, yes, ethnic Israel was going to be replaced with the true Israel of God. And, and so to deny that is, I'm sorry, it's to deny biblical teaching. But it's not replaced in this sense. It's, it's the Gentiles being grafted in, right? The true Israel, the remnant, always stayed there. But ethnic Israel, yes, was replaced by the Gentiles coming in, if you want to say it by that. And again, that's not me saying that. It's Peter saying that. And it's, it's, it's Paul and others throughout the scriptures. If God has a separate plan for Israel, and in some millennial kingdom in the future, according to this system, he forgot to tell Peter, didn't he? None of the New Testament writers mention this two-tiered system, again, Israel and the church. In fact, Paul points out passionately there are no longer Jews and Gentiles. Talked about that most specifically from Ephesians 2. So should not such a monumental agenda of God concerning Israel, as taught by dispensationalists, have been on the minds of at least a few of the New Testament writers? Like, none of them wrote about it? It wasn't. What is taught by them consistently is that believing Jews and believing Gentiles became one people, people beautifully united in Christ for time and for eternity. A careful reading of the Old Testament makes clear that ethnic Israel was never saved in her entirety. It was always the believing remnant that was saved. We see that over and over again. Paul says it beautifully in here, another favorite scripture passage of mine. This just, it's just undeniable what it says for anyone who's willing to hear it. Romans 2, 28 and 29. Romans 2, 28 and 29. Listen, a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly. Why would that be any different today? A person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. I mean, you want to argue with that? Paul was saying that way back in his day. That a person's ethnicity didn't matter at all. They weren't going to be able to say, you were a physical descendant of Abraham. It wasn't going to work. It was those who sincerely believed, those Jews along with the Gentiles, who were to become the one new humanity of God, a.k.a. the Israel of God. So then, and uh, let's just retrace some steps. Why then is there this huge emphasis on national Israel? Why is there this popular, popular end times teaching today where Israel is so front and center? And again, a lot of you will know this. Is this might be helpful for review for you, but especially those of you that are newer to this view, this is so important. In 1948, Israel became a nation after not being one for a very, very long time. And modern day prophets... We're absolutely convinced that Israel's becoming a nation ushered in the last days. They believe that that was what the Old Testament writers uh, talked about. We see a little bit of this in um, Isaiah 52, um, Psalm 102, uh, 102, various places in Isaiah where there's going to be this, this regathering, and, and, and dispensationalists believe that the regathering uh, that the Bible spoke about was Israel in 1948. Now, you can kind of see how they could get there, but that's what they thought. 
And so they saw 1948 as a launching pad for everything else that had to happen before Christ's secret coming, the rapture, and then second coming in order to inaugurate the millennial kingdom. That's why, and there's still lots of writings like this, but that's why you had specifically Edgar Wisenant uh, writing a book in 1988 called 88 Reasons Why Christ Will Return in 1988 because that was 40 years of biblical generation from 1948, which means he would have placed the rapture in 1941, seven years prior. And so for dispensationalists, this was a huge deal. Uh, they saw Daniel 70 weeks as postponed, which is just absolutely, well, we'll get to that at another time. And they saw 1948, that's when God stopped or started, restarted the prophecy clock. And that's why you had this, basically this whole cottage industry of end times writings that began at that time, which has now turned into you know, end times preaching and online and, and radio and blogs and vlogs and clogs, end times clogs. It's a new thing. Probably not. So going on, um, you know, Edgar Ridson Hunt writes that book. We already talked about Hal Lindsey. You got uh, Jack Van Empey, who had an amazing knowledge of scripture, but you know, he had literally had a newspaper in one hand and a Bible in the other. You saw this because they thought 1948 was that, that regathering process, which meant the world had about 40 years uh, left. Well, didn't happen, did it? But fortunately, from their perspective, these modern day would be prophets, something else happened in 1967, the Six Day War, whereby Israel extended its borders. Aha! They thought, and they taught. Now we know for sure the 40 years that we thought began in 48 wasn't right. After all, everyone makes mistakes. Therefore, the 40 years of this generation must actually begin in 1967. So from that time, Jesus now had till 2007 to come and rapture the church. Why 2K2000 probably helped a little bit because that's when his rapture that could then happen and his final return in, in 2007. Never mind that Jesus had clearly said this generation speaking to that particular contemporary generation and not that generation way off in the future. He said that in Matthew 24, 34. Again, book ended with Matthew 23, 36. But of course, that date didn't work out either. Well, what was the next step? It's now been determined by some of the leading proponents of the futurist view, dispensationalism, that a biblical generation may not actually be 40 years, but it might be 80 years. I've heard it stretched out to 120 years. Why not just make it a few thousand to be safe? Okay, and, and recently, I mentioned this too in a previous video, I called into a, uh, a live radio talk show and I, I got on air and unfortunately I, the reception where I was was bad and the call got cut off early. But, the, but these gentlemen on the radio did, you know, they were dispensationalists, but they did allow me to engage with them a little bit and I really wanted to focus on that Greek term for this generation and, and we weren't able to stay on the air long enough. Well, let me give you another aspect I think is so important. The main reason given in support of a geopolitical earthly kingdom is that Israel did not attain all of the land that was promised to her. I'm guessing you've heard that before. And so to, to their credit, because I think most dispensationalists are sincere believers, to, to their credit, they know that God always makes due on his promises, even though, according to their eschatology, he doesn't doesn't. But they believe that and they're sincere and they, and they want so much for God to make good on his promises that, that one of the ways they can justify this is to say, well, well, Israel today doesn't have all the land they were promised. Therefore, in order for God to make doing the promises, he's got to do it at some point. He's got to do it before the world ends. So we can at least see the, the reasoning there. I think the land didn't wasn't all given to them. In essence, since God didn't make on, good on his promise to Israel in the past, he will make good on his promise to Israel in the future. So let me give you a passage, a passage, <laughs> a passage from Joshua 21. Joshua 21, verses 43 to 45. Yahweh gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their ancestors. Could we not just say full stop right there? Yahweh gave Israel all the land he had sworn to their ancestors, and they took possession of it and settled there. Yahweh gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their ancestors. Not one of their enemies withstood them. Yahweh gave all their enemies into their hands. Listen, not one of Yahweh's good promises to Israel failed. Everyone was fulfilled. 
my dispensationalist brothers and sisters, or for any of you have who have dispensational brothers and sisters, who are we to believe? I've got to go with Joshua. I've got to go with the inspired scriptures. And I, I literally had a conversation. This is a good friend of mine who's a, and I, I thank him for this. I won't mention his name on the air. He's one of the few people who has actually allowed me to share my view of preterism from the scriptures. And, 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 and even though he doesn't, doesn't agree, who's actually been willing to actually listen. I showed him this passage one day. We'd had a meal at, at Denny's. We're out, you know, the sort of the, the meeting after the meeting. We're out. We're outside in the Denny's parking lot, and we're talking about Israel. He's talking about the land, and I show him this scripture. I had him read it, I believe. Let me just read it again, so you can hear the impact. So Yahweh gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their ancestors. They took possession of it and settled there. Yahweh gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their ancestors. Not one of their enemies withstood them. Yahweh gave all their enemies into their hands. Not one of Yahweh's good promises to Israel failed. Everyone was fulfilled. And he read it. I could see the wheels turning. And he looked right at me and he said, I don't think that's what that means. I don't think that's what that means. What else could he do? It was either that or acknowledge that he was wrong. Because Joshua isn't. Good place to close this video. Thanks for tuning in. Again, I encourage you to like, share, subscribe. Um, get this content out as far as across the street and across the world, closest across the street and as far as across the world. Um, that'll work a bit better. And uh, share this with people who have different views. Maybe you're someone, you've got family or friends, and you'd, you'd kind of like to talk to some of this, and, and you're not quite comfortable doing it yet. Again, I'm trying to make these videos to, to equip you, to help you know how to share it as well. But you might not quite be at that place. You should share this video with them. Let, let them get mad at me. Let them yell at me. Uh, Pastor Joel saying... Bye for now.